Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm thrilled to be here uh, to get to share with you a little bit about uh, an extreme environment that we're exploring right now with, uh, here she is, our girl on Mars. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so as uh, Lori said, I come, come to you today from RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. For those of you that may not have heard of it, it's actually was the first technological university in America. So we'll celebrate our 200th birthday in 11 years. It's, uh, it's a wonderful science and technology uh, university there. So fantastic. Uh, so what I thought I would do today, since we do have such exciting data literally coming down, I had 26 emails when I woke up this morning about the, our just the very latest data coming down from Mars, is to share with you a bit about uh, what we're trying to do with the Curiosity rover and how that fits into a broader picture of, of trying to understand whether life is out there within our own solar system. And I think you'll hear different perspectives throughout the symposium on, on life in the universe, on life on Earth, and so I thought we'd focus on Mars today. Um, just to say a bit at the beginning, and this is highly simplified, I would say, but, but, but the general thinking about when we, when we think about where to explore for life, we think about places that might have had the ingredients that, um, that could have led to life. And from studying life on Earth and its history, which you'll hear about more in the symposium, which is a fascinating subject, but we see over and over again the, um, the, the things that are the raw ingredients that could lead to life. So one, we think we need liquid water to have that medium to do the biochemistry that it takes for living cells and living organisms to, to prosper. We need that, those raw chemicals, the carbons, hydrogens, phosphorus, nitrogen, those things that make up living things. Um, and then you need an energy source. So stuff has to eat, right? Could be sunlight, could be other kinds of energy. Plenty of microbes on Earth eat rocks, so uh, there's, there's lots of good potential uh, energy sources out there. So these are the different ingredients, and our understandings of, say, for example, the different energy sources for life has changed dramatically over the past few decades, um, so that this is now sort of a very broad um, canvas on which to search for, for life. But when you ask yourself, in our solar system, where are the places where we might think about going and looking for these ingredients in, a, in an environment where life could have gotten started? And then the question becomes, one, if you find the ingredients, two, did you make the soup if you have all the ingredients? And that's the big question. When we ask ourselves where in our solar system we would go to look for this, there are many possible targets, including some in the outer solar system, places we wouldn't have imagined, again, a couple of decades ago, but thanks to missions like Voyager, we learned about the moons of Jupiter and now with Cassini about some of the moons of Saturn that may have habitable environments. But the one that we always come back to is this, Mars, my favorite planet outside of Earth, of course, uh, Mars is a fascinating place and has lots of, uh, lots of features that geologists like me really love. It has giant volcanoes and huge canyon systems. This canyon system is, you know, this, the Grand Canyon in the U.S. would be just a tiny little side canyon here. This is actually the length of the entire United States. Sorry for the U.S. reference, but those are the audiences I usually speak to. Um, Mars has polar caps, it has, its axis is tilted, so it has seasons, winters and summers, uh, and the polar caps wax and wane in those seasons. It has um, a day that's just a little bit longer than an Earth day, about 24 hours and 39 minutes. Uh, so there are many things on Mars that kind of feel familiar to us, things that we can relate to, but the things that make it the most interesting from an astrobiology perspective, that is the perspective of looking for life um, beyond Earth, have to do with features like this one, which is a little bit hard to see here, but, um, but nonetheless is a, a feature formed by water. And I'll show you some more pictures of of such features on Mars and, and tell you a bit about where we're exploring there and why. But so we think that today, it's quite cold at the surface, the temperature uh, during the day hovers around the freezing mark, and the atmosphere is very thin. It does have an atmosphere, mostly carbon dioxide, but it's only about 1% the thickness of the Earth's atmosphere. So liquid water today is not something that's stable long-term. It would either freeze or evaporate very quickly. But 
yet we see thousands and thousands of dried up riverbeds on the surface of Mars. And so we think that there was a time in the past, probably around the same time that life was emerging on Earth, where Mars did have abundant liquid water. And we know that from things like comets, as I showed in that last picture, where there are always going to be organic materials raining down on the surface, if not them being formed locally. And of course, with things like volcanoes, there's plenty of energy source. So there are your ingredients. And so the question is, again, did we make the soup? So Mars has been an object of our fascination for studies of life. And we have sent to Mars a, a fantastic um, machine to help us explore and understand whether or not life could have gotten started there. Now, how many people watched the landing of Curiosity? At least it was mostly, was it during the day here? Was it, yeah, it was in the morning here, right? All right, very good. So uh, it, we landed on Mars successfully on August 5th, California time. That's my birthday. So it was very good birthday, very, very good birthday. So just to take you back there for a moment, let's, uh, let's watch a little video here. So there were parties all over the U.S. and all over the world, actually. Things are looking good, coming up on entry. So these are the engineers. I'm a scientist. We'll see us later. The able reports entry interface. That was a moment. At this time, it will begin pressurizing the propulsion system to increase the thrust of the system. Uh, we'll use that for all the maneuvering in the atmosphere we're about to do. So this landing system, we go from 13,000 miles an hour to zero in seven minutes. Um, entering the top of the atmosphere here, that's a animation. The rover itself is folded up inside of this capsule. I don't think he cut his hair for the whole 10 years we worked on the mission. Vehicles just reported via tones that it has started guided entry. So we just got these little tones from the rover saying, okay, now I've started to slow down. Now I've deployed my parachute, things like this. But we could do nothing about it at all. Actually, it happened eight minutes earlier because Mars is that far away from us. So now slowing down and steering in the atmosphere. We are now getting telemetry from Odyssey. We are sending back data through an orbiter. That's the head of JPL. That's the head of NASA. Supersonic parachute. Parachute is deployed. An actual picture from the orbiter showed us going through the atmosphere. We didn't get that till later. Sea chill has separated. We're on the ground. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers per second. All right, this next part's the part that still scares the heck out of me. Standing by for batch off separation. Let's drop the rover. We are in powered flight. Coming down on rockets, because the atmosphere isn't thick enough to slow you down on a parachute. We're at altitude of one kilometer descending. And then if that weren't enough, we lower the rover down on a tether, drop the wheels. Single to us, you remain strong. Edge of our seats. Cut the tethers. This thing flies away and crashes. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. Nerd celebrating! Yay! <laughs> it was quite a moment. <laughs> Most of these guys have worked on this mission for about eight years, including me. Nye, science guy. You guys know him over here? You guys have Bill Nye? <laughs> got thumbnails. So within two minutes of landing, we have the first images down. Scientist name. This is the uh, Times Square in New York City. And here we are on Mars. So this landing system was quite something, and really, I'll tell you a bit about how it enabled so much the scientific exploration that we are now doing uh, with Curiosity. Uh, so, so that's where all of uh, the engineers and people around the country were. Here's where I, I was. Ooh, or not? Ooh, what happened? 
cool. That's very pretty, though. <laughs> Don't know what happened there. Didn't change anything. Help. <laughs> I don't know. I just, uh, yeah. Let's see. There we go, maybe. There we go. I don't know what happened there. Okay. Let's try it. There it is. Oh, yep. I think we're good. All right. So this is where the scientists were. They, we didn't get the blue shirts, but we were all together also at the Jet Propulsion Lab in California. This was about, again, about two minutes after we landed. And again, those of us who've worked on this mission for almost a decade, uh, it was a pretty exciting moment, especially after such a harrowing landing. And, and so Curiosity was uh, here on Mars, uh, sitting at the base of a gorgeous mountain, but uh, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here because that was not actually what the first picture looked like. The first picture looked like this. I call it a picture only a mother could love. <laughs> and that's because it was actually taken through a lens cap so the, the cameras had um, transparent lens caps on them, and, and those rockets that we came down on kicked up quite a lot of dirt, and so they're very dirty. But here you can see, we could tell the rover was healthy. You can see there's the shadow. And, um, and I remember at the time, that night, people said, okay, uh, so these are these sand dunes, and this is the mountain right here. And I was looking at that going, are you crazy? That's not the mountain. Well, sure enough, the next day when we opened the, the camera lens, there's the mountain that we landed right next to, and you'll see these dunes in another picture I'm about to show you, this dark line here, some sand dunes that were, uh, that were near here. But again, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's talk about where we went on Mars. So if you want to go explore for life on Mars, you want to go to places where you have the best opportunity to find those ingredients of life, um, specifically liquid water, which again, um, we think has been on Mars in the past, and we want to go to a place where that likely would have stuck around for a while. So this is actually our, the place that we landed. This is a crater called Gale. It's about 150 kilometers across. And this is a different kind of picture of Mars you're looking at now. This is looking at different altitudes. So red is very high, and purple is very low. And, and you can see this crater sits at a very interesting place, this very interesting geologic boundary on Mars that actually goes around the whole planet. The southern parts of Mars are very high and cratered. You can see lots of craters. The northern parts of Mars tend to be much lower and much smoother. And here sits this crater right on the boundary. And some very interesting things about this crater, one, um, that it sits on the boundary, two, that it has this big mountain in the middle, this big peak that sticks up even higher than the edge of the crater, which is very interesting. I'll show you more about that. Um, and three is that it does have this very low spot here. So white is way down here, the lowest of the low. So in this whole region, kind of the lowest of the low is here in the floor of this crater. But the most interesting stuff, and probably the easiest ones to see are over here. Can you see these nice... Um, dried river channels. And there's one right here that breaches the, the edge of the crater. And so it's quite clear that water flowed into this crater at some point. And of course, water flows downhill. If you want to go to the place where the water might have pooled, the bottom of this crater is a pretty good place. So these were all things that made us very interested in visiting Gale. And in addition, when we looked from orbit, we could see layers in the mountain. This is now a picture from one of our scientific orbiters going around Mars. And we saw layers, layers, layers. To a geologist, these layers are like candy. This is how we read the histor historical record of a planet is in these layers. Uh, so it looked like a very interesting place to go. So we chose that as our landing site after looking at hundreds and hundreds of sites and scientists fighting it out about which was the best place to go. So here's now another view of our, our home in Gale Crater. There's the crater. This is the mountain. Here's those dark dunes that I just told you about. And what we said to the engineers, we scientists said, okay, we want to go, we want you to snuggle us up right next to this big mountain, and so we can drive this rover up the mountain. We understand you probably can't land right on the mountain, but just get us as close as you possibly can to the mountain. And they said, are you crazy? You're going to make us like land between this terrible rim of this crater and this humongous mountain. Um, well, they said, okay, okay, so we'll have to build you this kind of crazy landing system to get you down there. We can't guarantee you can land in any one spot, but we can say with 99% certainty you could land within this ellipse. And that's 20 kilometers um, in size, the, the size of that ellipse, and we actually landed right here where the star is. So they did a very good job. 
And it turns out that this is a very hard thing to do. If we compare this, so here's our crater again. I flipped it around on you. There's the mountain. There's our ellipse. There's the edge of the crater. If we had tried to do this with, say, Spirit and Opportunity, those cute little rovers that have been driving around Mars for nine years, that's how big their ellipse was. Or back for Viking, again, 99% probability, that's how big that was. We never would have been able to go to this landing site ever before. And so I think this is one of the big innovations of Curiosity. It's, it's a combination of scientific innovation with engineering innovation that got us here. And they did it by steering through the atmosphere. That's how they were able to shrink down that, the size of that error ellipse. So good job on the engineer's part for getting us right up next to this mountain and also to, for building us an extraordinarily capable rover. So if you said on Earth, I want to go and I want to explore a site for life or for any other geologic reason, what would you do? What I would do as a geologist is I would, I would survey the site, I would look around, I'd look for the most interesting areas to go, I'd then walk up to those areas and start picking up rocks and pull out of my pocket my hand lens, my little uh, magnifying glass that every geologist carries in their pocket in the field, and I'd look at that rock very close up and try to do a quick determination of what kind of rock it was. And then if it was very interesting, I'd throw it in my backpack and I'd bring it back to the lab to analyze the chemical composition in great detail. Well, that's basically what Curiosity does on Mars, All, everything except the backpack, because it can't come back to Earth. So we put the lab here in her belly, uh, where she's got a couple of very high-end um, analytical instruments there that she's carried with her to Mars. I think it's a girl, by the way. It's like a ship, right? So I think, I think she's a girl. Um, so she is both a robotic field geologist, that is, she can traverse across lots of different types of terrains and drive right up to rocks. She can look at them with a, a, her magnifying glass. She's got a great a camera on the end of her arm here that does good microscopic imaging. And she can do quick surveys of the kinds of rocks things are, again, to look for things that might be different or interesting. And then she can scoop or drill um, dirt or rocks and put those samples into these incredible analytical labs here inside the belly of the rover. She also has a good weather station, and she's looking at radiation, which, which I'll talk about a little later, that can help us understand uh, how easy or difficult it will be for humans eventually to explore Mars. So that's kind of her, her capabilities in general. She was basically built to do what I would do if I could go to Mars. I'd just be throwing up the whole time, but uh, she does, doesn't do that, so that's good. Um, so she's got 10 instruments, 10 scientific instruments. It's an incredibly capable system. The payload, the scientific instruments weigh 10 times more than the payload we have on Spirit and Opportunity. So this is by far the most capable machine we've ever sent um, to the surface of of another planet. Um, everything from very high resolution cameras, HD video, stereo, um, and to the cameras on the end of the robotic arm. This robotic arm is uh, two meters long, the mast is two meters high, it's a very large rover. Um, to uh, an instrument that allows us to actually shoot a laser beam, pew pew, at, at rocks and make a little puff of uh, of gas that we then look at with emission spectroscopy. So again, it's a different ways of analyzing the chemical composition of the rocks and materials um, to uh, scoops and drills and brushes and sieves that allow us to sample those materials in great detail. So 17 different cameras on this rover. She's it's incredibly well equipped. So let's get in and talk a little bit about the results that we're finding that support the idea that Mars was once a habitable environment. And ultimately, that's what Curiosity's goal is, is to try to find habitable environments on Mars. If there was life there, could we detect it? Probably. Um, we think that's going to be a hard thing to, to find the exact right sample, but we think we should be able to find samples that will tell us whether or not Mars was really a habitable environment. Look for those ingredients, if you will, and see them come together in a nice environment. So we landed on August 5th, we checked out the rover, we wiggled our wheels and made sure everything was working well, and then we hit the road. So we started driving, and within only a couple of weeks of being on the surface, we started already to find evidence that we were right about thinking that water had flown into the, fl into the floor of the crater that we're sitting on. So these are some of the first rocks that we came across as we were driving across the plain. Um, they're kind of sticking up like somebody took a jackhammer to some sidewalk or something. Um, and when you zoom in, I'm going to zoom in next on this little spot down here. You can see nicely, I hope, that what this rock looks like is a very interesting kind of stone that 
looks like it's made up of other rocks stuck together. And here's a nice big, big clast that's been rounded. I like to actually look down here at the, at the pile of stuff that's weathering out of this edge right here. And there's lots of nice little rounded pebbles that have come out of this rock. So this is a rock that's made up of rounded other rocks that have been cemented together. On Earth, this, this would be a nice pebble conglomerate. That's the, what we call this kind of rock, and they form in stream beds. The, the pebbles are rounded by, by the flow of water. And, uh, and so here, just right away, just from looking at the types of rocks that we were finding, we saw evidence early on that water did flow across the surface of the, of the floor of this crater. At this point, it was too early in the mission to use our chemical laboratory, so we didn't actually get to drill into this rock or anything. But who knows, perhaps when we drive back by it on our way to the mountain, we'll, we'll stop again. We'll see. So early on, just seeing the right kind of rocks gave us positive indications about water. We were also starting to use the, the laser on our head to blast little holes in rocks. So just to give you a sense of this, and, and each one of these holes is about half a millimeter in size, 500 microns. And uh, they're done from a, a few meters away. And again, they make this poof of gas, and we get a nice spectrum for that. It's a great way to do a quick survey. So when you stop at a site and you can just blast the different rocks and see, does one of them stand out as being different? Um, so, so, but we just make tiny little holes. This is not what we're doing. People think that we must be blowing things up on Mars. That's not what we're doing. We're just making tiny little holes in the rocks. That's fascinating. Um, and then the other chemical, um, so we have several different ways of, of investigating the, the samples of Mars chemically, and so sharing those with you today. Um, in addition to our, our laser spectroscopy, we have an alpha particle X-ray spectrometer on the end of our robotic arm. This is what the end of the robotic arm looks like. It weighs 200 pounds. It's amazing. It's very, very complicated. This is actually our, our hand lens, the thing that a geologist carries in their pocket to look at rocks close up. But on the other side of this turret is an alpha particle X-ray spectrometer, and here it is deployed on a, on a rock at the surface that basically um, bombards uh, the rock with alpha particles and looks at backscattered X-rays, which have a particular wavelength that they come back for different kinds of chemical elements. So you can tell how much silicon, how much magnesium, how much aluminum, and you can determine the kinds of rocks things are. So again, this is a, a nice basalt that we picked, which is a volcanic rock for the first rock that we analyzed on Mars. Turns out that this is a very interesting composition of basalt. I'm not going to talk about it, but it has a lot of volatile, or a lot of volatile, a lot of alkalis, um, potassium and sodium, very much like um, basalts formed in ocean islands and things on the Earth, but different than any we had found on Mars before. So it turned out our first rock, which we specifically picked to be kind of a boring igneous rock, wasn't boring at all. So that's kind of fun and exciting. So we've been investigating rocks with the arm. But then we really wanted to get into our analytical capabilities and our analytical instruments. So the first place we did that was with the soil. Again, um, the dirt on Mars, as in this dirt right here at a place we called Rock Nest, because it looks like a nest of rocks, right? Really creative. Um, the soil on Mars, we've analyzed it with that alpha particle X-ray spectrometer at a lot of different sites because one flew on Pathfinder and there's one on each of Spirit and Opportunity. And it looks like this soil is the same everywhere on Mars. So that's a good first sample because it teaches us about the global layer. So we found this nice sandy spot and we scuffed it with our wheel to make sure that it didn't have a bunch of rocks in it. And then we scooped up some sample here in our scoop and we sieved it to um, grain sizes only less than 150 microns, or about a width and a half of a human hair. And then we stuck it into those instruments in the belly. So there's two instruments, two analytical instruments in the belly of the rover. One is a, um, an X-ray uh, diffraction instrument, and I'm about to show you data from both, that tells you the kinds of minerals that make up uh, a material, which is very important. And the other is more of a chemical analysis laboratory. And this is it here, it's called SAM. Uh, sample analysis at Mars. It's about the size of a microwave oven. It's about this big. And it's, it's a fairly amazing instrument. I, I will say, when I, for my PhD at Caltech, I um, spent four years of my life in a windowless lab under the stairs where the ceiling was literally sloped because it was under the stairs, heating up meteorites and extracting water and carbon dioxide from them, and then running down the hall to a mass spectrometer and analyzing the composition of those volatiles. And for years and years and years, I did that. Well, that's basically all done now inside this instrument on the surface of Mars. So we take a scoop of material like this, and we um, 
have a little bit of it that goes in through the sample tube. It's about half the size of a baby aspirin's worth of material. So a very tiny amount, 50 milligrams or so um, of material, goes into a cup, which gets put in an oven, and then it gets heated to maybe um, up to between 850 and 1,000 degrees centigrade. And the volatiles are, are released. Any volatiles and, and, or volatile-bearing minerals break down at different temperatures. And that material is carried into three different analytical instruments, all inside this one box. One is a quadrupole mass spectrometer. That's, and I'll show you some data from that in a second that's looking at all masses all the time to look at water and carbon dioxide and can detect organic materials up to very high mass. Um, then the next is a gas chromatograph. So these are three, six, I'm sorry, six columns here of a gas chromatograph, which is a very sensitive way to detect organic materials and separate them from one another um, as they go through these different columns. And then the third is a, a tunable laser spectrometer that allows us to measure isotope compositions. That is the amount of different um, types of carbon, uh, carbon-13 versus carbon-12, um, deuterium versus hydrogen in water and carbon dioxide, which is kind of my thing. I'm an isotope geochemist, so um, we, we are able to do that here with, uh, with uh, the tunable laser spectrometer inside of SAM. So as we heated up this very first soil and as we analyzed it in our X-ray diffraction instruments, here's what we saw. This is our, our first um, geochemical laboratory results on Mars. Um, with curiosity. So first of all, this is our X-ray diffraction pattern from the different um, minerals in the soil, and it's interesting. We found um, it mostly looks like it's physically broken up volcanic rocks, so minerals from a basalt-like um, olivine and pyroxene and feldspar, for those of you that are so inclined. But interestingly, it also contains a significant amount of material that was not crystalline. It was amorphous. It didn't have long-range order, but in fact, it was amorphous. Maybe 30% or, or one-third of the, of the fine-grained material on Mars is this amorphous material, which is a surprise. It's very interesting. And then when we look at what we got from SAM, from heating up that material, so here's the temperature of the sample going up to 800 degrees versus the intensity for different masses, looking at the quadrupole mass spec data now. So this is, for example, mass 18, looking at water. So this is a huge amount of water that's released at you know maybe 300, give or take, degrees C. Carbon dioxide, a couple of peaks here of CO2 release, a big oxygen release, which is very interesting, consistent with some results that Viking had previously seen, and also sulfur dioxide. And we also saw some, some minor phases as well. So this is interesting. The water, to me, this is one of the most interesting results. There's maybe three weight percent water in this soil. It's quite water rich, even though most of the minerals are actually not water bearing. They're mostly anhydrous minerals that we see with the X-ray diffraction instruments. So that means that most of the water is probably in that amorphous material. So if I'm an astronaut that's going to Mars and I want to try to live off the land, Leroy, it's very good. All you can do is you can scoop up some dirt and heat it up and you can get plenty of water out. So that's a nice thing. And of course, if you're going to try to, if you're a living thing trying to live in the soil, that's also good to have there. So it's very interesting. So we've got our first papers that have been submitted for publication that aren't yet out that will give more details on all of this, but hopefully they'll be out in the next couple of months. Uh, so the, that was the dirt. So moving on from uh, looking at the dirt on Mars, let me tell you a little bit about where we're sitting today. So, so this is a little bit complicated, but don't worry about it. So this is where we landed right over here. And, uh, and we've driven only about five or 600 meters to the east from where we landed. Um, we're currently sitting right over in here in this little place called Yellowknife Bay. And it's interesting when we landed, actually the mountain itself is kind of this way, so we sort of are driving in the opposite direction right now, don't tell anyone. But um, we'll, we'll get back to the mountain here in a minute. But we saw when we landed that we landed right next to this very interesting looking feature here at the intersection of three different geologic units. So that's what the colors are on this map. Sort of this um, hummocky terrain, this more cratered surface, and then there's this very light toned fractured unit here. And also this little region here, Yellowknife Bay, is. Remember I told you in the white part of the crater, the, low, the lowest region? This is kind of the lowest of the low. 
in that low region on the floor of the crater. So if we're going to be looking for evidence of water, this is a great place to go. So we said, you know what, we're so close, we're only 500 meters away from here. Let's drive over here first and try to do our first drilling campaign here. So this is Rock Nest where we did our first scoop, and now we're sitting down here on the floor of this crater. And as we were driving down into there, we found some other interesting rocks right down here. I've just got to show you these because they're really cool. Um, this is a place we called Shaler. Nice, thinly bedded uh, layers here. And if you look really closely here, you can see some, for the geologists, some nice cross bedding here. Um, and we think again that these, these look like they were laid down in the presence of water. They've also got some very nice concretions in them that seem to be, again, chemical evidence of, of mobilizing elements. And then we drove down onto the floor of Yellowknife Bay. Now, I have to say that as we were getting closer to Yellowknife Bay, people started doubting that it was going to be interesting. As we were driving up to it, we thought, oh gosh, this looks kind of like volcanic rocks. It doesn't necessarily look like rocks that were laid down by water. But as soon as we got down there onto the floor of Yellowknife Bay, we started seeing, and I hope you can see this, you see that white fracture right there? So these rocks are shot through with white veins. Looks like waters flowed like crazy through these rocks. And also they are full of things like these fractures and cracks. These always look like dried up mud to me. Um, uh, and so this is where we decided we would do our very first uh, drilling. So we have a drill on the end of the arm that can drill into rocks and sample them. And this looks like a great uh, place place to do that. So we did our first drill hole. This is the first ever drill hole on Mars with our drill bit here. This is about um, a centimeter. It's only about a centimeter across. So it always looks bigger in the pictures, but it's really quite a small and only uh, maybe five centimeters deep. And so the interesting thing here is the surface of Mars is red. Mars is red for a reason. It's very oxidized at the surface. As soon as we drilled down into this rock, it was nice and gray, which if you're trying to preserve organic material, this is very important. We think that in the soil, if there was organic material there, it's for the most part been oxidized away. Here, we're ho more hopeful that we'll find organics preserved in the soil. So that was our first hole. And here's our second. We just did this last week. So this is the before and after picture. And I like this because you can see here these little dimples in the rock, which are these little concretions of material. So again, what we seem to be seeing here is it's a very fine grained, probably a mudstone deposited in, in fairly shallow water or slow moving streams. Um, and then probably even overprinted by later aqueous activity as well. So if we look at what we're seeing in the drilled samples now. So this is a comparison of the, the scooped dirt from the, that I showed you previously with the drill powder from the first samples. We call this place John Klein. It's named after one of the engineers on Curiosity who passed away recently. They look pretty similar overall, and they are pretty similar. You can see the same features. But down here, you can see there's a difference, right? And this is... Um, minerals that are like clay minerals called phyllosilicates that seem to be preserving, um, that seem to be different in the rock than they are uh, in the soils. And we see that also when we heat up the samples in SAM, we see not just this low temperature water peak, which is still there, and this carbon dioxide and such, but a higher temperature water peak as well, which again is indicative of clay minerals that are indigenous to this rock. So um, here we have a nice, fine grain, relatively soft, relatively reducing um, aqueous environment that seems to have been a very nice place to live if you were a microbe on Mars. And I've taken this, this summary slide uh, of the uh, environment at Yellowknife Bay directly from our mission scientists so that I can make sure you see kind of the conclusions of the team here. But, you know, we went to Mars to look for a habitable environment and within six months we found one and it's very exciting. So um, the regional geology that we've seen here um, and the fine grain rocks that we find at the John Klein drill site looks like they are the distal end of an ancient river system. So we saw that there were, remember those dried up riverbeds that flowed through um, into this crater and we look like we're sitting at the end of, a, of an alluvial fan system that, and we had deposits at the end of that. And it was probably an intermittently wet, wet lake bed. 
Um, we see from the kinds of minerals we have with those clay minerals that there was sustained interaction with liquid water. It looks like, unlike other places on Mars where we found evidence of water with, say, the Opportunity rover that looked like they were very acidic, um, this actually looks like it was a fairly benign environment chemically. So not only was it aqueous, but it wasn't like very, very acidic or very, very saline. It just looks like a perfectly happy place to live if you were a microbe on Mars three and a half billion years ago. And it does have the key ingredients necessary for life, carbon, hydrogen, all these, all these various chemicals that we can detect with the rover. So all the raw materials are there. And, um, and it's got different... It seems to, we seem to see, say, in the sulfur chemistry evidence that there were both oxidized and reduced forms of different minerals in coexistence, which pro could provide great food, if you will, um, f if you were a microbe living in this environment. So all this to say, it's a nice place to live, but did anybody live there? That's the question. Were there any simple life forms in this lake bed? And the answer is, we don't know yet. <laughs> So stay tuned. Um, we're still working on uh, extracting the best data for whether or not, you know, what, if any, organic materials were present and, um, and how those might compare to what we might expect for living systems. It's pretty soon to tell, to sit, think that we would be lucky enough on the first place that we drilled to find evidence of life would be um, kind of too much to ask. But we're, we're definitely still working on it, so stay tuned on more information there. So we're finishing up right now. By the middle of June, we'll be done in Yellowknife Bay and we'll be ready to head for the mountain. So just to again get you oriented, these are these dark dunes, the mountains down here. Here's where we landed. Here's where we're sitting now. So you can see we haven't gone very far at all from where we landed. The odometer on Curiosity says 600 meters. We need to be putting some serious mileage on this thing. Um, so we're gonna start now our long drive to where we think is a good Entry point for Mount Sharp. We don't really want to drive across these dunes. We lost Spirit because she got stuck in dunes. So we're going to try to avoid that. And there's a nice little canyon to drive up right here. So we're going to set out for there in about the middle of June. It's probably going to take four or five, maybe even six months for us to get there. The rover only drives 50 to 100 meters a day. It doesn't, it's not a speed racer on Mars. Um, and then we'll start heading up the mountain. And we've got some views already that tell us that that mountain is going to be a spectacular place to explore. So we've taken from where we sit now beautiful pictures of the mountain. So there are those dark dunes. And you can start to see here some of these gorgeous layers that we saw from orbit and even some interesting um, uh, things up, up higher. Let's uh, give you a sense of scale here. So from where we're sitting to where we want to go, you can see it's, it's six to 10 kilometers away. So it's going to take us some time to get there. And again, my favorite image of, of the mountain so far. So look at these, look at the textures here. You can see the different layers have different textures to them. So there's clearly going to be some variation in the rocks that we see as we drive up. And we're very excited to get in there, start drilling into those rocks and start analyzing them. So that's kind of what's coming next starting later this year with Curiosity. Um, as I finish up, I'll just say that you can follow us on Mars. Uh, this is a, a mission in the, era, in the era of social media. It's actually quite fascinating. We get down images every single day. Every one of those images goes immediately to the website. So if you go to our, our Curiosity website and, and go to multimedia, there's a raw images button where literally every single day you can get the pictures. And the way that the rover works is it takes pictures and kind of postage stamp sizes and then we stitch them together to form large mosaics. Turns out members of the public do this faster than we can in the era of social media. It's fabulous. I love it. Um, and the rover, of course, being a modern rover, she tweets. Um, <laughs> She tweets as herself. It's actually three wonderful women at JPL who do it. Um, but it's a great way to follow the mission. And um, this is me. I'm on Twitter, too. And you can follow me. And I tweet a lot about the mission. And as I finish, I just want to say that um, I think uh, there are many possible environments out there where, where life could have gotten started. And by exploring those environments, we are really expanding our, uh, the reach of humanity, either with our... Uh, our robotic partners here, and this is uh, Curiosity's uh, cell phone pic. So this is the, she took the picture of herself with the camera on the end of her arm, like you would take a picture of yourself with your cell phone. Um, in this case, it's 55 pictures stitched together, but we won't go into it. Um, <laughs> and with the mountain in the background, and, and this was actually where we were doing our scooping, so that you can see the little scoop mark she made here in the in the soil. There's a new one of these out now from our drill site as well that you can find on our website. 
So here she is as a, as a robotic explorer, but the work that she's doing is, is going to pave the way for the human explorers as well. She's found a radiation environment that's not much worse than the radiation environment on the space station. So as we think about sending humans to Mars, um, she's going to help, uh, help pave the way for that. And it may well be that, that it takes human explorers to really answer these questions about whether or not life got started on Mars. Um, and, and I think... Um, the goal of getting humans there safely and really doing that scientific exploration is, uh, is a laudable one, and it's something that we can do if we, if we all work together. And so that when that first astronaut takes a step on Mars, I think she's, uh, she maybe have a Molecular Frontiers Foundation T-shirt on underneath her, uh, underneath her uh, outfit there because it's going to be somebody who understands chemistry and biochemistry will be a very helpful, uh, helpful astronaut there, and you can tell she's a girl because she's got blue nail polish on. Um, <laughs> So with that being said, I think there's a, a bright future ahead for uh, astrobiological exploration of planets, and I'm happy to take any questions now or later, and thank you so much.